sports as a whole um, is serving massive audiences and entertaining massive audiences worldwide. Um, and sports more and more incrementally utilizes cutting edge technology to deliver unique experiences to, to spectators all over the world. Uh, and at Sephar, frankly, we've become more and more interested in the topic of uh, the intersect between sports, business, and technology. And so to introduce our special keynote, I'd like to introduce uh, and invite uh, my partner, Doug Higgins, to join me on stage. Doug. Front. Uh, last slot before tequila. It's always a tough slot. But hopefully we'll make it worth your while. And you know, for me, one of my favorite parts of an event like today is you have people from all over the globe representing vastly different industries and businesses. Yet there are lessons that we can learn from each other. And one of the kind of unique industries um, that you might not think of as a technology executive, but is undergoing huge digital transformation um, and then with, with very significant leadership challenges facing them is in the sports, media, and entertainment industries. Uh, Sapphire Ventures um, is spending a lot of time in this industry and uh, I think we're very fortunate because we have one of uh, the most successful business people um, governing one of the, not one of the, the most popular sport in the world. Sorry for all you USA soccer fans, the World Cup is still going to happen, uh, even without the US, believe it or not. Fran Soriano was uh, a top executive and a board member at FC Barcelona between 2003 and 2008. And if you're a soccer fan, you know how successful FC Barcelona is. But what we probably didn't know was how non-profitable it was. For example, Ferran helped grow their revenue from 123 million euros to 308 million euros, while turning a 70 million euro annual loss into an $88 million profit. He also helped um, sign and train some guy named Lionel Messi, but we'll, we'll get to that, maybe save that for uh, later in the Q&A. What, uh, what's most um, interesting now about Fran is his current role. He is CEO of City Football Group. And if you're a soccer fan, you probably heard of Manchester City. But what you don't know is that, probably don't know, is that Ferran, as CEO of City Football Group, has helped expand beyond Manchester City, where he has a company that now owns teams in New York, so NYCFC, in Australia, with Melbourne, with, in Japan, in Yokohama, in Uruguay, and now most recently, Spain. And Fran's going to give us the opportunity of what's it like managing a global business with all these different franchises, talk about his time-tested kind of leadership strategies as well as philosophy, and talk about which skills endure and which ones are going to evolve in the world that we're all uh, living today. So Fran, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. So I, I have to tell you first that the briefing they gave me is I shouldn't talk about technology. So I'm going to talk about soccer, and I'm going to try to get some lessons I've learned from the world of sports, from the world of soccer, that are valid, I think, for our businesses and for our lives. And they have to do with leadership. They have to do with team management. They have to do with making decisions at the right time. And I think I will be able to deliver some of these lessons with soccer examples. My history with soccer starts, as Doug said, with FC Barcelona. The, my first day in office, I went into the office of the president. So the president that was living, that was much older than me, uh, grabbed me by the shoulder and he said, boy, I'm going to give you just one advice. Don't come here with your business sense, your business tools, or any common sense at all. <laughs> this is very easy. The ball gets in, it's fantastic. The ball gets out, it's shit. <laughs> it's pure chance. I didn't believe that to the extreme that I end up writing a book called 
the ball doesn't get in by chance. The results in sports depend on being smart and hard work, like in any other human activity. So my role for the next minutes is try to convince you about this. And I've chosen these five ideas to share. Starting for the first one, the formula for the winning team. Well, obviously, the first thing I should say is there's no formula. And if there would be a formula, I would not share it with you for sure. <laughs> but here's my try. Commitment times balance elevated to talent. And what do I mean by that? Commitment, I mean the commitment that soccer players, athletes, or CIOs have, whoever, in winning. The commitment to deliver the best of you and winning. And this has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with how much you're paid. I like very much this old law by Henry Mintzberg that said money is, money can um, help you not being angry because if you're not paid appropriately or if you think that your colleague is being paid more than you, you'll get angry. But it doesn't take you to be happy. Happiness comes with something else, comes with something that comes from within, something that helps you wake up every morning and go to the office. This is, I think, true everywhere. But in the world of sports, it's very significant because it's so competitive. 5% less commitment of a top player in a top team means losing the game. So let me tell you what I mean. So I'll give you an example of commitment. An FC Barcelona example in 2003, we recruited a Brazilian player um, by the name of Ronaldinho. He wasn't very famous, but he was hungry, eager to win. And, and it helped us a lot. So I'm going to show you an image of a game against Real Madrid where I was at the box watching the game petrified, very scared because we had lost the previous four games and I was petrified. This is him about to get into the pitch. So this guy is not petrified and he thinks he's going to win. He really thinks he's going to win. He was totally committed. I got to tell you, two years later, we won. We actually won everything. And his priorities changed. And he was devoting less time to training and more to other activities in his personal life, especially at the, in, the, in the evening. And, and he lost his commitment. So that's my, my first piece of the formula, commitment. The second is very important. Balance. And by balance, I mean balance in the team. And I mean two types of balance. First, you know what to do. You know what is your function in the team. But the second, and very important, and critical in a sports team, is you accept your role. Which means that some players are going to be stars and are going to be scoring. And some players are going to work more and be maybe less recognized. And teams work when this balance exists. So I've learned more from failures, like I guess everybody else, than from um, successes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about the story of a failure. So this is 2006, FC Barcelona. We won everything, the league, the Champions League, everything. We go into the next year, and things were not going very well. So what happened using my formula is that commitment went down. Some of the players thought, we're, we won. We don't need to work that hard. And the balance of the team got destroyed. I'm going to show you how a soccer team that was successful was destroyed to the level of not winning anything. And it has nothing to do with tactics. It has nothing to do with coaching or any technical issue. It has to do with people. So at that time, there was a very good player, a very good striker, African striker called Samuel Eto'o who was maybe the second best player after Ronaldinho, he worked very hard. And in the, first, in the first years, he would accept that he would work hard, Ronaldinho would work less, 
in defense, but he would have more talent, score more goals, help more the team. In 2007, Ronaldinho was less committed, and then Eto started to think, why do I have to work more than this guy? He gets, he, he gets all the praises and he doesn't work. And one day, one insignificant day, in a little village 30 miles south of Barcelona, he went to a charity event. He was leaving the charity event after he had done his thing, and a journalist asked him a question. And this is what he said. It's in Spanish, but you will have subtitles. Perdono, pero no me olvido de nada. Y volveré. Lo único que puedo decir. Yo no tengo ningún problema con nadie. Y me he encontrado en una guerra que no es mía. Es la guerra de dos personas donde yo me llevo todos los palos. Pero digo, si alguien tiene los huevos, decímelo en la cara que me lo diga. Cuando ha sido mi jefe, nunca me ha saludado. Y pasan atrás para pegarme palos. Esto sí, es de mala persona. Y de mala persona, los que salen en una rueda de prensa y dicen, Samuel Eto se ha negado a jugar, lo que tienen que pensar es que Samuel Eto siempre ha entrenado con sus compañeros. Estando lesionado con golpes y toros, yo siempre he entrenado. Yo, Samuel Eto, siempre he entrenado. A partir de ahora, que digan lo que quieran. Yo he cumplido siempre con mis compañeros. Y de esto voy con la cabeza alta dentro del vestuario. Y lo único que me interesa es de vestuario para adelante, para adentro. Lo de fuera es para ustedes. Y si queréis saber lo que ha pasado, lo preguntáis a Arashka. Yo no hablo, pero os digo, el que quiere meter el, la prensa dentro del vestuario es el que sale en la prensa y habla de las cosas. Y esto hay que saberlo. Y yo, si salgo y hablo, la gente seguramente dirá lo que va a pasar. So this is a disaster, right? So he's a star player. He gets on, on TVs of all around the world. He says, I won't speak. I won't speak, but. And then he talks about bad people. He talks negatively about the coach. A disaster. So I'm sitting there and say, what do we do now? Right? So we try fake news. So we get, we get Ronaldinho and Eto to hug each other at the beginning of the coaching session the next day. And we have the cameras ready. They do that, but it was fake. Nobody believed that, right? So we have a, we have a guy who's a, who's a sensible guy, another Brazilian player, that says, I, I want to help. Let me talk to the media. I want to help. Creo que hay mucha buena gente en el mundo, pero hay mucha gente mala. En vestuario hay mucha gente buena, pero hay gente también que no quiere nada. Entonces, el mundo está así. No es solo en vestuario. Entonces, nosotros dentro de nuestra de nuestro grupo de 25, 20, 23 jugadores, más los entrenadores, formamos una familia. Y muchas veces tenemos en la familia una oveja negra. That's it. He says, we're a family. Every family has a black sheep. The guy said that the next day, the newspapers, front page, who is the black sheep? Right? This, try, this guy is trying to help. So I'm showing you a case where the balance of the team, the emotional balance of the team was destroyed. And it had nothing to do with their ability to kick the ball. And I think this is extreme, but it applies to every single business. If our team is not committed, if our team is not balanced in the sense that people accept their role, we will end up having problems. I'll continue with more ideas about what's in a winning team. And I'm oversimplifying with the, these three characters and saying, we need a visionary, somebody that, is, that has the vision, that is an enthusiast, that points, that guides the organization. We normally need a doctor, no. This is typically the finance guy, no? the guy that says, no, we can't do it. We shouldn't be doing this. The guy that is prudent and has perspective and realism. And ultimately, we need somebody that gets things done. I call it the backbone, somebody that will take the fight between the visionary and doctor, no, and say, okay, I'll do it. I will go and open this new office. I will go and carry the company on my shoulders. In football, is exactly the same. We have players that see what others Sorry, do not see. Players that invent. A long, long way here, Aguero. Oh, what about that? The hapless Pepe Reina looks on, astonished. 
we also have every team needs a backbone. Every team needs somebody who's going to carry Captain the weight Marvel, of the team. He leads by example. I thought his performance today was was huge, and he was, he, he was in the right place at the right time. Big, strong, reading of the game there. No surprise, he's picking Flaney up. Look at him battling with Rooney there. He never lost the battle all afternoon. Again, he's got hold of one of. He's got hold of him, Rooney's got hold of him. He's just not going to lose that battle. It's amazing with all City's attacking players, they look a so much co a competent team and a better side with company in, in that team. It's amazing, really. He just seems to let the whole team. This is the player, this is the guy in your office. So when things today, go he was, wrong, he was totally dominant, where totally things are challenged, and, and you ask the other players to actually react to him. I mean, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. He actually... Let me talk about Dr. No. The equivalent of Dr. No in a soccer team is what we call the holding midfielder. The holding midfielder is a player that would have a different perspective than the rest of the players, would sit back and hold the team. Hold the team in the sense of correcting mistakes of others and making sure the shape of the team in the pitch gets maintained. And I encourage you to look at this player. This is a Brazilian player, Fernandinho. And look at where he is. He's waiting to correct a mistake. He runs in a different direction. He's holding the team. He's protecting his teammates. He's, he's a good doctor now. So I, I asked my, myself in, in my business and our offices and our clubs around the world and people in the finance departments and the marketing departments, do we have a visionary? Who's Dr. No? Is Dr. No respected enough? Do we have a backbone? Do we have somebody that will do whatever needs to be done to get the job done? Let me move now to leadership. The main thing that I've learned in sports and also in life is you have to choose your leadership style depending on your team, which is easy to say, but it's counterintuitive. Because we identify leadership as charisma. Like I'm very charismatic, and I'm a leader. I'm going to tell you what to do. It doesn't work. It works for a while. But if you want to be a coach of a soccer team for years, you have to understand who is in your team, what do they need, and deliver to them. And using my very simple formula, you have to think about how much commitment you have in the team and how much talent. If you're in a new job and you find a team with no commitment and no talent, you toast it. You have to rebuild the thing. But what happens if you find people with a lot of talent but not enough committed? You need somewhat of a coaching style. You can't tell them what to do in an aggressive way. That you can more if you find people that are committed and don't have a lot of talent. They might accept that you tell them what to do that you have more of a direct style. And again, I have a story of a failure to share with you. This is, a, this is an Italian coach um, who coached Real, Real Madrid in 2007. Remember I told you we won everything in 2006 and we, and we lost everything in 2007. This guy, when, this guy is Fabio Capello. He went to Real Madrid. He understood that we at Barcelona, we had more talent and his only chance to win was to focus on commitment. So he took his two best players, Ronaldo and David Beckham, and he fired them because they were talented, but they didn't have enough commitment. He built a team of committed players with less talent, and we lost the league against them in the last, in the last day. So at the time, our coach was Frank Reichardt, a very good coach who started coaching the team at some point, the team was winning everything, and we had commitment and talent, and he started the process of delegation, where he would, he would uh, work less and give less advice and guidance to the players until the team, was, the team disappeared. And he should have gone back to coaching. He couldn't, and we changed the coach for Pep Guardiola at the time. You now the next question is, OK, so if I have to choose the leadership style that I need for the team, can I be a leader? So again, I'm giving you an idea to answer this question. Do I have enough content? So do I know about the subject? Can I manage people? 
if you don't know how to manage people and you don't know what you're talking about, your leadership is, is very weak. You can only be the leader for political reasons. You can be a dictator, a dictator, but not a leader. What happens if you're here? If you know, about, uh, if you know a lot about your technology or whatever it is that you're doing, but you don't know how to manage people. I like this example. Dr. Greg House, if you've seen the series, he's the, better, the best doctor. He knows more about everything, but he's an asshole. And he treats his people very bad. And they still want to be with him because he's so clever. That happens in the movies, not in real life. <laughs> if you treat people like shit, they will wait, and they will stab you in your back when, when they can. And I have plenty of examples of coaches in soccer that they're good coaches, but they don't manage the teams well. And then people just wait for one day, the day that they lose a game or a championship. And this inevitably happens. So who are the best? Obviously, you know, we have in Manchester now one of the best, if not the best coach in the world. And he does this very effectively. He knows about the subject, but he cares about people. I've heard Leo Messi, the, the best player in the, in the world, very difficult to manage. He would say about him, he's very tough, but he's fair. His way of being fair is you don't train at 100% one day, the five training sessions of the week, you don't play on Sunday. That level. But everybody respects him because he knows what he's talking about. So. You know, I think in our fields, we could decide whether, obviously, we all want to be coaches, but maybe we have to develop, and we can develop with people management skills and content. But I also think that if you end up being a facilitator, somebody that gets people together, but actually don't know about your subject, whatever technology you're working on, ultimately, the system will push you out. Because in times of difficulty, you want somebody that knows the subject. Let me talk about timing. I was fascinated to hear Rebecca and Renata talking about timing. You want to be a fast follower or you want to be on the cutting edge of any technology. You know, you know more than me about this so, because the technology is so important. Timing is everything, also in football. So where do you take decisions? Do you take decisions ahead of the curve? When you take decisions ahead of the curve, you're leaving some value on the table because the best point is this point, right? So. The guy that decides to sell one minute before the market crashes. I, I once uh, met the owner of the biggest real estate company in Spain in 2007. He sold the company for $3 billion. Everybody told him it was a bad idea because the market thought that the company would be worth $4 billion. That was in 2007. Six months later, the company was worth zero. I happen to know the guy who sold and left one billion on the table, and the guy who bought and, and lost three billion. So where do you want to be in this curve? Again, I'll share with you a bad example, my example. Ronaldinho, the player that got Barcelona to win everything and lost the commitment. We had an offer in summer 2007 from Chelsea, 60 million euros. At the time, it was the biggest transfer in the history of football. And we said no. And I can guarantee you, by, the, by that time, we already knew in the back of our heads that we had a problem with this player. And we didn't have the balls to execute on a decision that was obvious. One year later, not 10 years later, one year later, we sold the player for 20 million. It's all about timing. I'm going to share with you a couple of more ideas. So one is about the value of having values. So do we need to have a shared uh, group of beliefs in a company or in a, in a football team? Do we have to believe in the same thing or not? My answer is yes. And the examples, the good examples that I have at Manchester City, at New York City now, tell me this is the way to win. To have a set of ideas even very simple ideas that everybody believes in, no matter what. Ours are very simple. We call it beautiful football. And we say, you know, with these ideas, we have a reference framework for all the coaches. We save uncertainty. 
we give consi consistency, we generate emotional attachment, and what it means is you're a coach in our organization. We have six clubs in five continents, so we have thousands of players and coaches. So if you don't believe in this, attacking football, effective ball possession, playing in a high defensive life, don't come to work with us because these are non-negotiable. This is the way we understand the business. You don't like it? Go work for somebody else. And I want to show you a video of an example of this. And I want you to um, travel to the final of the European Super Cup. This is Barcelona playing against Shakhtar Donetsk, and it's a bad game. So things are not going well. We finish um, the game 0-0, and we go to extra time. And things are clearly not going well. Barcelona is not scoring, is not creating chances. So when things don't go well, you have to decide whether you want to change or not. So I want you to see what the coach said to the players before the extra time. Again, it's in Spanish, but you can read in English. Asegurar el pase. Un momento sin riesgos atrás, hacerlo bien. Cuando pasemos el balón, ni una al medio, decía Pep Guardiola. Delante de esta Xavi. Como siempre, jugar a tener el balón y sobre todo vamos hacia adelante, a lo nuestro. Nosotros por delante del balón. Ellos están esperando la contra y no van a cambiar. Hacerlo más que nunca, a lo nuestro, el balón. Recordaba Pep Guardiola justo antes de empezar la prórroga. A lo nuestro, el balón. Si tenemos el balón podemos hacer lo que sabemos. En 30 minutos podemos hacer gol. No preocuparos. Bueno, es lo que dice el entrenador del triplete a un equipo que inicia una prórroga en una final. No preocuparos de nada, hacer lo que sabéis, con paciencia, insistiendo una y otra vez. No nos volvamos locos porque si no nos van a matar. Tocamos y tocamos, no preocuparos. Solo le faltaba quitarse el traje, ponerse la camiseta y salir a jugar también. No preocuparos, insistía, paciencia. Los 10 hacemos las operaciones igual que siempre. Ahora más que nunca es moverse, moverse y moverse. Y crear constante situación. Abrimos el campo y en principio buscamos la banda. Y ya habrá espacios por el centro. Ok, señores, como siempre, vamos. Y fueron. Y ganaron. So, things are not going well. And he says, do not worry. Do as always. Do what you know how to do. As always, he says in Spanish, a lo nuestro. A lo nuestro, meaning, let's do our thing. Do not worry. Be patient. Continue to do what we know how to do. And we won. And this is very important because it shows this consistency and this idea that we're good at this. This is what we're going to do. And when things get difficult, we will, we will continue to do the same better. Obviously, it's fair to say, if we do our thing for five years and we don't win anything, then we'll have to change the strategy. But in sports, and I think in life, it's very important at some point, once you've decided your values, your strategy, just stick to it. And it's very difficult in this business because people get nervous. Because owners of teams would go to the coaches and ask them to change stuff without having no idea about what they're talking about. And sometimes the value of the coaches and the executive is just keep people calm and continue to do what we know works, what we know how to do. I'm going to finish with one last thought. And this is about giving up. When do we give up? So I think in life and in business, you can argue about this. So there's some times where you've tried and tried and tried and tried, and it's time to, gi to give up. Maybe you give up on one thing because you'll find another one. I've been in these situations. But soccer and sports is giving me a lesson that is very bold, very simplistic. Never, ever give up. That's it. And I have to tell you, my, my times in football, I have applied this successfully. I was sharing with, with a group of my executives an email. So this is a, a business story. So we're chasing a big contract with a sponsor, one of our main sponsors now. And I'm in New York. I get a call at 5 a.m. Immediately, I think something's wrong. So this is my commercial director that calls and says, have you read the email? And I say, no. And he says, don't read it. <laughs> right? So immediately, I open my computer, <laughs> and I go read. 
And there's an email that say, read this first. Obviously, I skip this one, and I go down to find a letter from the chief commercial officer of this big global corporation, very big one, that says, I re regretfully say that the board has not approved the deal. And we don't want to be partners. And then, you know, the team, the first thing that we did was start talking on how are we going to recover this partnership. And I promise you, I had an email that said, we've done all the process, went to their board, and the answer was no. I, I talk about this now happily because we, we uh, were able to revert that. And now this, this partner is one of our best partners. And I've learned that in football. So somebody told me when I was a kid that things might go wrong one day. And that person was wrong because things will go wrong for sure. Life, personal life, and business life punch us in the face. And, and we, can't, we can't decide this. What we can decide is how, what do we do? How do we react when we lose? And we can learn that from sports. And the best example I have is a goalkeeper. So think about a goalkeeper. A goalkeeper um, can make mistakes. But every mistake is very expensive. It's a goal. But once you are a goalkeeper, if anybody has played as a goalkeeper, the worst moment is you've conceded a goal and you have to go back to the net and pick up the ball and throw it back. That movement is maybe 10 to 20 seconds. This is all the time you have to recover. All the time you have to come back to the pitch and believe that you are going to save the next ball. In business, it's different. You don't have 20 seconds. You might have 24 hours or maybe a week. But that's the hardest part. And the most important value that I looked in the people that work with us, resilience, recovery. Can you recover when you concede? Because bad news, you will concede for sure. What do you do in these 12 seconds? How do you recover? How do you swallow the defeat? and come back to the pitch, whatever pitch it is, and say, I'm going to win. I learned a lot of this from goalkeepers. They're mentally very strong, as strong as I want to be in business. And again, the very simple lesson I've learned is don't ever give up. Just don't give up. And I'm going to finish now. I'm going to finish with one video that illustrates this. And I want you to travel to 2012 and I give you a bit of uh, setting of the situation. Manchester City is playing the last game of the season at home. Manchester City is a team, is the fastest growing team in Europe now, but at the time uh, they haven't won the league in 44 years. So one more game and they're champions. Manchester City is number one in the table, they're playing against number 17 in the table. So it looks easy, right? The stadium is full of people. The city is waiting for Manchester City to win. Manchester United is playing another game, waiting for the miracle that Manchester City would not win. So the score is 1-0 Manchester City, 1-1 QPR. This is the opponent. 1-2 QPR. And we get to minute 90. And people are crying in the stadium. So I have stories of people that left the stadium because they're in minute 90, and we're losing after 44 years. The referee gives five minutes extra time, which is normal in a, in a game like this. And this is what happened.
That's it. Never, ever give up. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. That was uh, very inspiring, um, especially those of us, as we talked about, who are U.S. soccer fans, to uh, see a winning moment. And uh, thank you for, uh, for that. One of the things that you've also talked about um, and did at Barcelona was innovation off the pitch as well. One uh, interesting sponsorship deal was the UNICEF partnership deal with a nonprofit and, and helping the, the Barcelona brand globally. Can you talk a little bit about that? And let, let me take this to the, to the strategic challenge. So if you think about um, global soccer teams, we have a challenge which is almost exactly the opposite that uh, Rebecca was talking about Procter & Gamble. So, the opposite that you would have you uh, work for Procter & Gamble. So we have brands that are gigantic. We have millions of people that love our teams, <coughs> and we have very small businesses. So the number is a, a, a big team, Manchester City or Barcelona or Juventus, we would have revenues of around $500 million. And research says we have 500 million followers in the world. So it's $1 per follower per year. It's ridiculous. So the industry has, not, has never found the way to engage consumers and monetize them. So we have a lot of love, and we don't have enough business. If you work for Procter & Gamble, I'm saying this because I work for a, for a company like Procter & Gamble, and I was selling fabric softeners, which is a very ugly product, chemical product, but it's needed if you want your clothes soft then you have the business and you don't have love. And you have to invent love. You have to create, in my case, we created a teddy bear that would be in the, in the brand and would try to convey this love for something that is an ugly product that you need. In the world of football, it's the other way around. We need to find business models and we need to find ways to be relevant in the world and to engage with fans. The case that you're mentioning about uh, Barcelona, Barcelona is a, is a special case because it's not a company, it's owned by the fans, and it stands for something that's called more than a club. And we were looking for how to deliver the idea that we are more than a club and we're here for the good of the world on a global scale. And we thought that the best brand that could help us communicate that was UNICEF. Then we decided to let go 10 to 15 million of revenue for the sponsor in the shirt to have UNICEF because we thought that that would help us more than 10 or 15 million a year to deliver our message to the world. One of the, I want to ask one more question and then open up to the audience in the um, interest of time. One of the things that attracted Sapphire Ventures to you and CFG um, as well as vice versa was love of innovation, technology. You're talking about um, a team now with all these clubs all over the world, you talk about consistency as one of your core leadership tenets. How do you leverage technology in terms of player development and keeping that consistency, just like a lot of the people in the audience are managing global organizations? How do you ensure that consistency and that value system and belief system that you talk about? So at City Football Group, we have three businesses. One business is we're in the business of entertainment. We have teams in several continents that play soccer and people watch them and pay for it. That's one business. But we have another business that has to do with players. We have so many good players all around the world and different teams at platforms at different levels that help us develop their talent. But to be able to do this, we have, they have to be coached the same way. They have to understand soccer the same way. And for that, we absolutely need technology because we have coaches and we have thousands of players in many different places in the world and technology has to help us so that a guy that is coaching a group of kids by the age of five, this is real, five in Melbourne, Australia, he has to use, he has in a, in a tablet the same coaching methodology 
that the coach that is in Manchester coaching the professionals. So that's our second business. The third business is we invest and we are, we are present in several soccer related businesses. In our, our business development department has a sign at the door that says, if it's not soccer, don't call us. But if it's soccer, we want to do lots of things. And, and one of these is we're, we're, we're trying to set up a, an investment fund in sports and technology with Sapphire. And I think well, we're very excited about this because it covers this idea of being present in the world of sports and making the use of technology. You, you know better than me that technology is going to change everything. But in the world of sports, it's so clear. It's so clear that a lot of the things that were done by humans will be done by technology. And this is very difficult to accept because there's lots of coaches in the world in any sport that will tell you this is not about science, it's about intuition. And I can see where a good player is a good player or not because I, I've been 50 years in the business. Not true. Technology can help and will help. Will help on coaching and managing the games and winning and will also help in the first challenge that I mentioned to you, which is we have so many people that love our product and our brands, and we need to talk to them. We need to engage with them, and there's no other way that extensive use of technology. Thanks. Questions from the audience? We have a couple minutes. Um, the question is really a management question, and, and having coached some of the biggest um, brands in the world or, or led some of the biggest brands in the world uh, in the player brand, how do you balance the performance and the brand, a Messi, a, you know, any of these star players? Because that line between commitment of that they have to their own brand, which is separate and apart from Barcelona or the team, how do you, how do, you do that as a leader? And how do you, because I think that's very um, relevant to what we do when you get a star performer on your team. I think what I've learned over time is that this is very simple and very bold. We are about playing football. Everything else doesn't matter. And there's always, 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 I give you the crazy example, always somebody from marketing, the marketing department that would tell you the value, the dollars that we would get if we would have a Chinese player playing in Manchester City is unbelievable. We, we, can't, we can't talk about this. This is about performance. And even if you have Messi, and he's concerned about his brand, personal brand. It has to be about performance. Because if you deviate one millimeter from this, then you lose everything. If one day you allow, it's, it's very simplistic, but it happens. Players have commitments that have to do with their sponsors. If one day you let a player leave the coaching session five minutes earlier because he has a commitment, a commercial commitment, you're toasted. Remember the formula. Then the balance of the team disappeared. So even if you have a, a top performer, it has to be a top performer in the pitch. And if it's not, he sits on the bench. That's the only way that works. Rami. So I uh, maybe date myself a little bit, but uh, I remember when uh, Trevor Francis was sold, I think it was Nottingham Forest for a million pounds back in, in the late 70s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's Rami's partner giving him a hard time back there. Uh, and the market, and people was like, that, this is out of control. And then Ronaldo, and now Neymar, and now there are rumors about Messi. I mean, where does, is there a notion of sanity in this market? And where is the balance? So the first thing we, we need to say is that there is sanity. So that, if I give you the example of Manchester City, we, we are a profitable company. So, and you might say you pay a lot for, for the players, like the New York Yankees or the Dallas Cowboys, but actually we do it because somebody is willing to pay the money to go watch this, uh, to go watch, watch our, our, our games. Um, several times it has happened in the industry that we say, okay, that's too much. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. Ain't going to happen anymore. And the bubble keeps growing and growing and growing. So you don't know about the tech bubble. I don't know about the football bubble. There is maybe one uh, exception. So this summer, Paris Saint Germain has spent a lot of money, and the logic of their investment is outside the industry because they have the revenue. So 
an easy way to look at this is in the Premier League, the revenues of the top five teams are between 500 and 400. In France, PSG has 560 million in revenues and the second team has 160. And out of these revenues, more than half are sponsors coming from the ownership, from Qatar, basically. So that's an exception, a disruption in the industry. But in general, the industry pays a lot to athletes because we can, and because they are the ones that produce the product, that produce the show. Um, so two-part question. First part, other than Pep, which soccer manager do you admire? And in business, which CEO do you look to for business inspiration for, that you can take back to soccer? Um, so there are, there are many good coaches uh, now in, in, in the world, and they've become stars. They're different, right? So maybe you can argue that the two best coaches in the industry, they, they live in the same city, Manchester, <laughs> Mourinho and Guardiola, but they're very different. So the product that Mourinho delivers is the opposite of what Guardiola delivers. It is more defensive style of play, teams that are very solid defending, and they play the counterattack, bigger uh, players, maybe less talented. So it's just a different product, but they're good coaches. Also, the way they manage the media. So Guardiola tries to be a bit more low profile, and Mourinho <coughs> plays with the media and with the, with the fake news environment, right? <laughs> so, but if you, look about, if you look technically, there are some good coaches, young coaches that do extraordinary things in Germany. For example, the coach of Hoffenheim, small team, with a smart coach that have done very well. The type of coach that if I were, that I would sign, I would hire to coach the US national team. <laughs> for, for example. <laughs> so, so there are very good coaches out there. So in terms of admiration for uh, CEOs, I, I look at, at a lot of them. Um, one, one, um, one thing that lately I'm more focused in, we have some people that joined us from uh, Amazon. And uh, I've been fascinated by their focus on accountability. So it happens in our organization, and happens in a lot of them, where people, we have a lot of great ideas. We have an environment that is non-hierarchical. And, um, and people try. And we, I say in the meetings many times, we are about trial and error. And I have an Amazon guy that says, OK, but Let's measure the trial, the error, and let's learn from it. And that's something lately that I uh, adopted. Well, I know we've gone over time, but uh, I appreciate your time, Ferran, and uh, everybody. I think Rami's going to wrap us up. Thanks again, Ferran. Thank you.